Good afternoon. My name is James Deitch, and this will be my discussion question for dissertation research for week one of class 701. Today is the 26th of August, 2022. I've gone ahead and modeled my discussion question around my own uh, area of expertise or area of focus uh, for my specialty, which is the American Revolution. Uh, more specifically, I am looking at the argument over the role of uh, auxiliaries versus mercenaries, uh, referring to the Germans uh, that fought for the British during the American Revolution. As a research question for this discussion, I chose the Battle of Trenton, the first Battle of Trenton. And the question is whether Colonel Johann Gottlieb Brawl, who was the commanding officer for the Hessians at that garrison, was guilty of tactical negligence or personal negligence. So the problem uh, with this question, and problem uh, that we're addressing with the question, is that through various narratives and accounts of the battle, particularly in popular culture and secondary education narratives, they have described Colonel Rawl and, and generally his subordinate German-speaking troops as being inebriated and otherwise distracted and not prepared due to the holiday season and the fact that both armies at that time had gone into winter quarters, so there was no great anticipation of any offensive action by either party. Ultimately, though, Colonel Rawl lost the garrison at Trenton, and there's been various reasons that have been attributed for that. Uh, this question will uh, research that and flesh it out and come to some conclusions. The assignment methodology was for us to go to ProQuest look at similar dissertations, do research on the dissertations, uh, being able to navigate through the system and find other work that will tell us how relevant and important the questions uh, that we may pose and the arguments that we might make um, can be. Can they bring anything fresh to the discussion and the storytelling of history? So in that, we, we went ahead and uh, took a look at uh, several keywords that would be relative to this discussion and narrowing it down. The good news and the bad news is that there is not a lot of body of work either in master's theses or doctoral dissertations with respect to Hessians during the American Revolution. That being said, there were three that stuck out. Um, the most recent one, uh, that we would look at would be Mr. Cosby Hall. He took a look at, a, a very fresh look at, what the French and the Hessians uh, viewed the Americans like during the American Revolution, put through their own lens, through their own societal and cultural lenses. That will be useful to the overall uh, discussion and research. However, um, Robert Oakley Slagle, back in 1965, did a dissertation that was very telling. It focused right in on the von Losberg Regiment. So that was critical um, to any research that's being done in central New Jersey uh, during 1776 and into 1777. So his insight, although dated at this point, being over 40 years old, um, still brings a lot of value and uh, reference to the discussion. Mm -hmm. Most interesting was Melody Andrews and her 1986 dissertation, where she looked at the question of uh, the role of the German mercenary in the coming of the American independence. Now she uh, made a very interesting comment in her title because it's called Myrbidons from, from abroad. And Myrbidon is a, a reference to the Iliad, Homer's Iliad, and the ancient Greek soldiers at the time who were somewhat considered to be mercenaries, but that uh, direct translation from Greek is ants, referring to the Hessians in her title. So kind of gives you a little bit of perspective of where she's coming from and, and what the argument that she might make. So very valuable to look at those three dissertations and evaluate whether there's uniqueness to the argument. Is something new and fresh going to be able to be introduced by a new body of work? And I would say that based on the availability of other dissertations and, and capstone papers, that there is room to expand on and provide a more scholarly and, and peer-reviewed uh, piece of work. So that, that's good news. Uh, the bad news is that there's less articles out there and papers to go ahead and, and contrast against.
your own information. So there we'll do a lot more direct reference to primary resources. Now, having said that there is not a lot of dissertations out there, that's not to be confused with the fact that there's a tremendous amount of writings on the subject, uh, both primary and secondary. Most of the primary ones are going to be translations by Bruce E. Burgoyne, uh, who has since passed, but he's a retired Army colonel that did the vast majority of the translations um, from German into English, which is quite the nuance based on uh, the two languages relative to the time and how we understand the languages today. Those are fairly recent narratives that are considered uh, exemplary amongst academics. So great source there. The other ones are, of course, the, uh, the, the direct uh, German journals that are available, particularly to this question, which would be Lieutenants Peel and Lieutenant Wiederhold, who had uh, pretty substantial and quality uh, journals that they kept during the war, and they had their own insights into Colonel Rawl and his performance. And so with that respect, we want to talk slightly about um, Truman and Damien Radke, uh, who Truman will refer to in, in his manuscript. Um, Van Radke was, was of the peace of mind, Leopold Van Radke, of everything must be based on fact. It's very singular, and he looks for truth. And I, and I like that because that's in line with our Christian values that we seek to find truth. Now, that's not to say that we're looking strictly for a, a series of facts linked together that, that creates a narrative or a storyline, but to seek truth in what we're reading, which can often be absent in a secondary source. I've referred to Lieutenants Peel and Wiederhold as primary sources, so those will be excellent tools to go ahead and, and analyze from their perspective what it looked like on the ground as junior officers, the performance of Colonel Raw, the overall performance of the regiment and their ancillary troops, and contrast that against the American's performance. So there we'll get a, a good feel. There are other great manuscripts at the time by George Bancroft, Mercy Otis Warren, written in the period of 1798 to 1805, while both of those individuals wrote tremendous uh, secondary works on it, the knowledge that they had, although they were involved at the time, was really through their contacts with others. It wasn't through firsthand experience. And that's where we really need to, to draw the line and the contrast um, between the different types. And that's where True Order and uh, Truman and, and uh, Ron Rodke will, will guide us. This is greatly opposed to somebody like Mark Bloch, uh, the French historian um, who really believed that everything had to be linked and understood and put through the lens of how a event uh, would interact with other periods of time, how they were relative to each other, how they would be viewed. It really tells you what lens that you're supposed to put a uh, historical idea uh, through to consider it. And in this particular case, I, I, that doesn't apply. We're not looking for a more scientific approach. We're not trying to quantify uh, what this was like, but we do need to apply some science in how we uh, extract our resources and what those resources are and what they tell us. And then of course, we also need to take into consideration Carol Reardon and the work that she did, uh, Pickett's Charge, where she analyzed what that lens actually looks like for the individual on the ground when you're looking at primary sources. It's a weakness that we need to consider uh, in primary sources. And what Carol pointed to is Lieutenant Frank Haskell and, and a couple other individuals in the narrative that in their testimonies post-battle, what was their recollection? And they found disparity between individuals that could be in close proximity to each other on the battlefield and yet experience that battle and see that battle in a different way. Fortunately, we have multiple journals so we can look at Lieutenant Peel and Lieutenant Wiederhold and see the similarities and perhaps how they, they, they lack uh, contrast or do, or do contrast each other. Um, and then we can weigh that against General Washington and his subordinate officers uh, as well, what they saw um, because they did intermingle on the battlefield. So they were looking at the same things through different perspectives. We'll find these to be the most valuable and more in line with the truth that Truman and, and Van Radke are, are talking about. So at the end, as we look at the popular culture and the history that's been portrayed of the Hessian soldiers as being unprofessional and barbaric, barbaric strangers as, as uh, 
uh, Mercy Otis Warren would refer to them in, in her manuscript. Um, they were perjured uh, by these claims of drunkenness and illicit behavior. And the utility of the propaganda lent itself um, to these mischaracterizations at the time. Um, we find the accounts of the disposition of the troops in combat and in confinement a different reality than the descriptive characterization provided by Jefferson, for example, in the 25th um, grievance of the Declaration of Independence, where he discussed the foreign armies that were coming to commit acts of perfidy, great barbarity. Uh, that type of language was designed to rile up the people and bring them to the cause, as opposed to being any real historical basis for how we understand the Hessians to be. Remember, at the time that the Declaration of Independence was written, the Hessians hadn't even landed at Staten Island yet. There wasn't a German on, on American soil that they could point to as an example of a grievance uh, that had occurred, but rather this was a warning against something that was going to come. And there, as we look at popular culture, we need to make sure that that bias that's inherent in the storyline of America doesn't translate into our understanding of the facts that we're, that we're looking for. And so these mischaracterations uh, may be useful in exciting the curiosity of an amateur historian or an undergraduate. We have to be uh, much more confident, uh, I guess, um, much more confident, conscious of the uh, devastating implications of the moral and the uh, epistemological um, nature of, of historical knowledge. And, and in that, we can look right back into uh, Truman's manuscript and how he addresses that. So the correct account will demonstrate that Colonel Rawl disobeyed direct orders. He did not take counsel of his subordinate officers. In fact, he failed to pay attention to a critical piece of intelligence that was handed to him the evening before. Um, he ignored this pertinent intelligence. So when you, when you take all that into consideration and the fact that the troops were on in, supposedly in winter quarters on both sides, defenses were down, and to make matters worse, they were in the middle of a horrendous snowstorm, it's understandable that Rawls Defenses were weak at the time, both in physical stature on, in the town, but also in his, his mental defenses. And then that was not due to inebriation or otherwise being distracted. It was more due to arrogance, if anything, failure to follow direct orders, and most importantly, to listen to the things that are happening immediately around him, people trying to get his attention. So the other part of this is that we have to recognize chance that occurred. Remember, General Washington had two of his commanders not able to make the crossing uh, across the Delaware River just south of his position. So those two failures, the snowstorm and Rawls' weakness in his defense and preparation, allowed Washington probably to shine a lot better than he did. All the same, this was a turning point in, in the war, so it, it's still important that we consider that. So finally, the question is, what does this matter? What does it matter? Did, did Rawl lose the battle? Yes, he did. Does it matter whether he was inebriated, unprepared? All the reasons are causal, certainly, to the outcome of it, but not necessarily for us to look at the Americans won the war, and now we need to look back for moments in time. Um, it's best to understand them completely in a vacuum before we start to try to interrelate them to other events. Block uh, would stretch that out over a long period of time. I think in the near term, as you look at this as a bigger body of work, we will need to understand that battle and how it transpired, but we need to seek truth in the battle itself. And I think there's ability to do that. Uh, Melody Andrews and her dissertation comes closest to addressing that problem. And I think that we will uh, be able to solve this through further research, applying the methodology, and then making sure that all of the valleys are filled. Um, one last thought I'd like to leave you with, and that comes from John Lewis Gaddis. He's got a wonderful book called The Landscape of History. But one of my favorite parts of that is on the, on the cover of it, he's got a painting called The Wanderer Above a Sea of Fog. It's, uh, it was painted by Casper uh, David Friedrich. And the premise behind it, or at least how Gaddis describes it, is that the, the subject of the painting, this, this gentleman who's standing on the precipice of a cliff and is looking out over the fog, he, he feels like he's got a mastery of the 
overall history, the narrative of history, and yet he fails to grasp what is underneath. And so I think at what Gaddis reads into it, and I concur, is that looking out over the haze of that fog, you feel like you've got a mastery of the overall story, the American Revolution. It was fought by the British and the Americans. The Americans won and there's independence. Interweaved in this are all these stories of those who actually participated. Uh, remember that the Hessians, the Germans, comprised one third of the entire British army. And on the same token, there were many that fought on the Patriot cause, including German immigrants who had settled in the Pennsylvania area in particular. So we can't lose sight of the insignificance of the individuals within the story. And so my research here will look to Colonel Rawl and set the story straight. Yes, he lost, but why did he lose and why is that important? As one of my former professors taught me, I was asked the question, so what? And if you can't answer that, then you haven't asked a good question. Thank you.